And I was reading um, Catelyn Moran's liner notes. Um, you and she go back a wee way. Yeah. We ran into Caitlin year, many years ago when she was a journalist for The Times and doing music stories mostly. I am reliably informed it's Caitlin. Um, By her. I'm slightly worried now because I've been calling her Caitlin for 25 wrong, years. Wrong, oh, wrong, wrong. So wrong. She's so nice that she didn't want to... I'm sorry. Yeah, you've embarrassed yourself wanna... then. Oh, well, I know now. Thank you, Kim, and it's I'll tell her pleasure. it was you that told me. I'm sorry to break the bad news. OK. Um, but, yeah, well, she goes back and her, her and her husband, Pete Perfides, are a wonderful couple um, who I've known... And uh, it's actually... Per- no, I've got that. No, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> the police have arrived. <laughs> um, no, no, they're a fantastic couple. And I'm going to get to see them that often, but when we do, it's a, it's a riotous good time because both of them are really sharp um, and funny people. And uh, we've had some connection and these guys have got to know um, Caitlin as well. Did I say that right? Yeah. So really? a good hybrid version yeah. of it. Caitlin. You've Cat- got a Cat- bob each way going on there. <laughs> and... Um, when yeah, and they're they've been very big supporters of my music and our music, and they've been to see shows. And um, I just think that with we got the bio question came up, who's going to write the bio? And it's always better to get somebody, I think anyway, that's a good writer and good character, and it's going to have some entertainment value. But she's very, um, it's glowing, you know, it's a glowing bio. So we're very S- thankful to her. Surprise, surprise. Like you thought it wouldn't be glowing. Which I thought she might Come be undercut on. with some kind of sly humour, ah, and it is a little. Yeah, no, she's pretty straight. Except, I'm I read it, and I'm I'm trying to work out Liam your marital situation, because I thought you got married in Pihar. I did, but I, that was the sort of uh, legal version of the thing. And oh, we, this was the illegal this is, this version is the in Greece. Pagan, pagan version. The I like pagan to call it. Version. Yeah. With Poseidon, Poseidon rising from the waves. Poseidon, interpretive dance. Sounds all. a lot of fun, although, yeah. according to Catelyn, you were unconscious for a large portion of the time. Uh, well, actually, that, that the unconscious part was actually a relatively short amount of time, at least in my memory of it. Yeah, well, um, you wouldn't. That's right. <laughs> but that was not self-inflicted inco- unconscious. I'd like everyone to know that. Yeah. Was, it could have been, but it was a riotous night. But I had a friend who I won't name because he's, he's still um, shamed by it, but went to pick me up on his shoulders, but went the wrong, wrong way around where he put his head through the front of my He thighs came in from the front, yeah. And lifted so. me up, which I immediately toppled over and landed on my head and hand and dislocated my thumb. So essentially he tackled you. I yeah. guess so, yeah. So that yeah. you fell forward. An illegal tackle at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Possibly a spear tackle. I was dancing on a table or on a chair or something, which, you know, yeah. was a sign of the height, the height, the literal height of where we were at. It put you at the right height for him. He yeah. thought it. He, just, he got the mechanics wrong. May have had something to do with I suspect with if you were dancing on a... Sorry to interrupt, but if you were... Hmm. Da- just getting the facts straight here. Yeah. yeah. If you were dancing on a table or a chair, yeah. I don't think you are in a state to complain about the way you were tackled. Like you were... Uh, you didn't see how well I was dancing. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah. It was showing off really quite spectacularly. And I was at the bar with this gentleman who shall remain nameless and the, the owner of the bar had decided to give us a very uh, sip of his very rare special occasion... Um, liqueur from the back of the bar, which I think probably would be illegal um, in any other country of the world. But we had a quick shot of that and my friend went running kind of wildly with his arms waving and the first thing he did was try and pick Liam up the wrong way around. So, so it was actually Spiros's fault? Well, kind of my fault in a way. OK, there's a lot of people to blame. Yeah. This is only coming out now. I feel like this is the first time you're really talking about this. We are working on it. Yeah, it's quite And well, this quite is what I aim well. for. I aim mm. to bring families together in this way. <laughs> well, a therapy session. Yeah. yeah. There's lots more to, to... If you want to go that way, we can do lots <laughs> more of that. That's good. You're all involved in this album, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The whole damn family. There's mm. Sharon and there's Elroy. And yeah, there's yes. There's even a brief feature by the, the, the Devo, the Devo Finns as well. There's Tim... And Harper oh, yeah. and Elliot on one track singing. That's right. So they, you know, we're all c- accountable. Why do you call them the Devo? Well, they call themselves the Devo, the Devonport Finns, because they live in Devonport. Ah. But, I, but I always read it as Devo Finns because ah. I'm a Devo fan, which ah. I think we've even talked about once no, upon a time. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So they're in there as well. Uh, well, yeah. they just didn't. They came in for. A, we had a, a few songs that needed sort of a bit more of a um, group. Choir sort of effort, not choir, more of a kind of group sing along thing. Yeah. Actually, Back to Life, which has just come out, originally had everyone on there, but we um, took them off. We took them off. <laughs> yeah, we took, we they're on another track though. <laughs> they're on another track. Yeah, <laughs> we changed the song, so the lyrics changed. They ended up on the cutting room floor. Yeah, I, 
Um, I uh, uh, read a reviewer talking about you guys, and it was in a Singapore newspaper. I don't know. Oh, wow. And it said, a New Zealand brood fated for their conviviality. Mm. Oh. That's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. I'm delighted by yeah. that. Yeah, that's one of the nicest things anyone's ever said about I us. Know. And oh, I mean, because we like do a, a sort of uh, a Google Translate gone wrong. <laughs> it might be or right in our case. We we do pride ourselves in being able to have a really fun time together, and we have transformed a few um, parties and weddings which were a little bit slow to take off. In fact, Liam, I would give great credit for um, doing that exact thing, whether it's jumping into the pool at the right time or. Um, you know, making the dance floor turn into a, a like, well, you know, there was that place that time in Palm Springs where you hit the dance floor at a very staid old models party with your underpants and kicked tables over and yeah. I'm remembering. It's a good time, guaranteed for all when the fins turn up. Well, just, yeah, you've got to make something happen if yeah. there's nothing happening. Because we, we're just trying we to gonna, make memories, you are know? Are we going to, yeah, I know, you're trying to write, right. Are we going to get through the next half hour or so without you guys making something happen? Uh, well, we're going to we'll make some music happen, but I'm feeling pretty mellow. I'm Good. just going to put it out there. Um, I just want to talk about the first we track on this album, Island of Peace, which is really sweet. And w- you composed this for the occasion of the mm. pagan wedding of your yeah, son. Yeah, I right? did, yeah. And I was working on it sort of in headphones in this little room off to the side between swims on the island. And... We debuted it for the wedding and everybody had to do interpretive dancing to it. With it. <laughs> um, in theory, a whole video clip for it of all of our friends dressed in white doing quite um, flamboyant um, moves. Aww. Yeah, for about, uh, it, you know, but deeply dorkish. Yeah. As well as being beautiful and, you know, yeah. sentimental. It sounds like the kind of occasion one might lock oneself in the toilet for a certain amount of time till it was all over. To avoid... Yeah. <laughs> no, everybody was wrong on everyone. Yeah, that's the thing. And we all went for a swim together in our white outfits too. After that, and that was pretty great. And then these people turned up around a corner on a boat with trumpets playing the bridal waltz. This was completely unscripted. There was a gypsy. Uh, is that word okay nowadays? Um, there was a circus in town, and they were carnies. C- carny folk <laughs> came around the corner I mean? on a on a boat playing trumpets um, very badly. Uh, the bridal waltz. But uh, at dusk, and it was one of those amazing nights, actually, I've got to really? say. Really? Yeah. Completely, yeah. Um, suddenly they We were... didn't ask them to do it. They just knew there was a wedding on. They thought they'd come around ah. and surprise us. Of course, they got invited into the wedding and they drank more margaritas than anybody. Ah, yeah. margaritas. So we it, sort of befriended them and so worked they... worked out. Yeah, they kind of... They got the vibe something was happening and then they really... They made it even more surreal and absurd than it already was. Yeah. What yeah. happened to Retsina and Uzo? What's margarita? Was... That's a bit... Um, tray, isn't it? We imported just, a few yeah. pompous little drinks, but you know, we had a lot of them. No, there was a lot of Ritzina and and uh, Uzo going as well. I must say, anger plays a part. Which, on the album, Mick Fleetwood um, joins you on. He does. I, I'm instructed that you don't wish to talk about you know the Fleetwood Mac thing. So consequently, I'm obliged to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> um, when are you on tour with them? Uh, in later in the year, yep. um, August, um, well, from August we're rehearsing. Um, the reason that Mix ended up on the, the record, and in some ways I guess it leads uh, in the thread of the whole way the whole came, thing came about was reconnecting with Mick after meeting him many years ago and us just having a memorable conversation in the corner of a, of a party and um, met him again at the New Zealand Music Awards and just sort of facetiously but wishfully said, we're making a record in a few weeks, Liam, my brother, my son and I, and um, do you want to play drums on it? And he went, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned up, you know, to give him his due. He just thought that sounded like a nice romantic thought. He loves New Zealand. He what ne- was he doing at the New Zealand Music Awards? They were touring. He was about to play a show. Oh, that was during the tour. Yeah, right. and then he came and, like, he's. it's a measure of the man that he's so gracious and has got time for people that actually sat through the whole New Zealand Music Awards where others may have flagged and done what they needed to do. He sat right what to What are you end. suggesting? The New Zealand Music Awards are boring. Long, I would have said, right. but not. I, I would hesitate Neil to use Finn that adjective. Neil says New Zealand Music Awards too long. <laughs> Stop <laughs> press. Yeah, I don't mind. No. I'll, I can take that one on. No, yeah. well, that was good of him. That he does, does seem like very a, genial sort of a chap. He is a very genial guy and he's got time for people and he's a charming, lovely man. And we got some great stories and did some great playing and uh, the whole family 
got for, but we got very fond of Mick. Yeah. Good. And likewise, and he said, come on tour, and you said, okay. Well, we said, come on tour <laughs> in January because we just went out on tour and did all these little country halls and mm. uh, we made a film and we thought Mick might enjoy it and he would have, but he couldn't find us, as it turned out. He came and he... Where we, were you? Well, I didn't, couldn't even tell you where we were. It was too we were obscure. in Oaka when he called and then we were in Paikakarihi when he called the second time saying he couldn't find us in Oaka. <laughs> Yeah, he, and then, mean, he went down to the Catlins looking for you and couldn't find you. Yeah, that same pronunciation I noticed the Catlins. Yeah, yeah, as <laughs> Catlin Moran. No, you always said Catlins, I suppose. Did you? No, actually, but I had that one right. You know. I had that one right. Yeah. The Catlins. Ask him about how he says cucumber. Oh, how do you say cucumber? Cucumber, of course. Oh, really? Yeah. I suppose he says serially as well, does he? Don't even say that one. No. <laughs> I'm not saying. Perish the thought that all your music sounds alike, but there is a there's a thin imprint, mm. and that's I suppose it's inevitable. Did you feel that with Betcha Duper, Liam? Um, it might have been less noticeable with Betcha Duper, but I definitely because that was you know, springing away from the family bosom, was it? Yeah, maybe not um, consciously, but the, you know, to be honest, in Betcha Duper, there was always two sides of what we did. There was the kind of more punk side that we were probably. Um, excited about because we were young and had a en- lot of energy and played live and liked to rock. But there, I always wrote pretty um, songy songs at the same time since I was, a te- you know, early teens. And I think there were, on our records, there was always kind of half and half and some of it sort of sounded a bit more inspired by someone like Elliot Smith or Neil Young or things that probably were more in the same realm as what Dad does. And, you know, obviously I'd listened to Dad's music since I was in the womb. So It's in your bones. Yeah. And, you know, I still... I still hear things a certain way that I can tell comes from some sort of... Well, I think it's a, a nature and nurture thing. It's com- it's combined, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. in there, but... He's got a tender side, that, that boy. A tender side? A tender side. You make yeah. him sound like a... Slap me around, it meat. gets tender. I know, that's the thing. He's been slapping me around for so long, <laughs> yeah. it's, I've gotten real tender. Yeah, it's a funny word, isn't it? Because it is a... That, that, because of that double meaning but no I mean he's got a tender I love his voice in that tender mode and that's what I would regard that song as uh, suits that there's a certain um, you know tenderness yeah it probably is more natural than when I'm trying to scream songs that's always you know that's uh, very enjoyable you'll ruin your voice you'll ruin your voice I remember dad coming down when I was first playing with friends (laughs) in a um, downstairs in the studio screaming Nirvana songs and just going (laughs) I think I did say that dad came down and went you're going to ruin your voice before you've even got one they said punishing and what did you say Liam well I don't think I can say it on here (laughs) that's right yeah pop eat it get lost pop Yeah. yeah Stop yeah. being such a dork. Don't try and control me. Do you think that your careers have in some way matched each other? I mean, you went off, Neil, to split ends to London in, mm. when you were 18. Yeah. And, Liam, you went off to Betjadupa when you were not much older than 18. Well, younger, actually. Were you? Yeah, we were like 14 when we started yeah. um, and 16 when we first released something. But I guess there's correlation in age and that kind of thing, but in a way we've had very different experiences of it, I think, anyway. You know, and it's a different era as well, so it's all, you know, there's so many aspects that were different. But apart from being young, Dad joined his older brother's band and Mm. I started a band with my mates at school, you know, and in New Zealand, you know, Dad went straight over to the UK with them, which we ended up doing when we were about 20. Yeah. You went from Australia to the UK, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't last long in Australia. We went there and realised, what are we, why are we putting in all this effort somewhere that's three hours away from home? (laughs) (laughs) It's just as far away from the rest of the world. That's why we came back to live in New Zealand. We suddenly, why are we living in another city that's as isolated as New Zealand and we might as well be home, you know? But now people come over to see you. Yeah, they they do. You've made New Zealand a musical centre. People make the journey from Melbourne. There's a there's a, a bunch of people that came over for the little community hall tour of New Zealand and came to just about every show from various places. Did you enjoy that tour? It was yeah. golden month. It really was. Mm. Um, we went to some of the most interesting little places in New Zealand and drove some incredible roads we'd never been on. Met some real salt of the earth, funny people. Um, 
and play. I feel like you must know everybody in New Zealand by now between the two of you. Well, everyone looks familiar yeah. to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you get that when you get old. Isn't that funny? Ah. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I'm also can't you also spot the New Zealander on the streets of London? I always can. So can. Yeah. What is that? I don't know how it could evolve that quickly. It's only like, well, and when I'm saying New Zealanders, I'm suppose I'm talking about European New Zealanders have a different look. Yeah. Than um, than Europeans. It might be the weather beaten thing. Sometimes I think it's weather beaten, but then they could be Australians, and you know they're not Australian. Yeah. I think but, it's uh, thick ankles. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. But I don't. Excuse me. <laughs> Thick ankles. Yeah, I do. New Zealanders I have think, thick ankles. No, I'm getting this generally. Is, this is news gold. Come on, this shoes interview. off. That's better than uh, saying the thighs because Liam that was where Finn I was going to go says next. New Zealand women have thick. I didn't ankles. say women. Oh. You said women. Oh. Oh. I You're said talking New Zealand men. <laughs> no, I'm talking about all. I'm talking about all uh, ethnicity. New Zealanders, all New Zealanders, all uh, all races, all, all races, all yes. genders. How would that possibly be true? It's a dairy thing. <laughs> It comes from our dairy intake and our cows down here are very particular and I believe it has an effect on our bodies. Is he making this up, Neil? Look, I'd go with it because lately I've been discrediting him and, and he's, he's proved to be right. So, you know, yeah. let's ring Fonterra. It certainly... Would he lie to us? It's certainly coming out quite smoothly. I don't know. He would. All right. <laughs> Liam Finn destroys dairy industry in 30 seconds. Yeah, yes. that's all right. Milk, you'll end up with thick ankles. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, New Zealand milk. Come on, kids. Don't you want thick ankles? You've got a baby now, Liam. I do. Buddy? Buddy, yeah. I'm th- I, really buddy. Yeah. I'm thinking, do you watch Modern Family? No. Uh, it's very funny. And Jay in Modern Family calls everybody buddy because he just can't remember their names. Right, well, that's all that So works. I wondered if you had actually given your child a name that you couldn't remember, so you just started <laughs> calling him buddy. No, it was actually that everybody, he actually thinks everyone knows his name because he hears people saying, hey, buddy, <laughs> all over the town. <laughs> but that's no, no, it was actually, some, to be honest, it was something that um, we didn't we didn't have. We had a few other names during the pregnancy, and then when my wife was in labour, she was sort of going, come on, buddy, come on, little buddy. And she never used the word buddy in her life that I'd heard. So there was me and her mum kind of looked at each other and thought, oh, buddy. And and to be honest, when you're in, because we, we had the baby in America, and it, it does feel like quite an American name. Um, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, was seemed fitting. Yeah. But when we were um, in the hospital, they put a lot of pressure on you to name your child there on the spot. They were really insistent that before we left the hospital, you better have a name. Why? We were like, how dare you tell us Do that? Do you have to sign something? We did, and they were trying to make it out that it um, would be a big hassle for us to have to go to City Hall to register his name if we didn't do it there and then. Wow. And, you know, they were preying on some very fragile sleep-deprived people who yeah. had just gone through the most intense 48 hours of our lives. and then So, Liam, so we went, the name's you, Buddy. If you, <laughs> if you had your wits about you this time around, what would you have called him? <laughs> um, probably Dinesh. Dinesh. Yeah. You, there is yet time, but, of course. Yeah. It's a, they're a very litigious country in America. I would suspect it's something to do with the fact if anything happens in the car on the way home, Buddy can't be sued if, if he's got yeah. no name. <laughs> And right. they're worried they won't be able to, you know, because they they, they'll sue everybody. So, you know, that's what I'm my theory. Yeah. The other thing that has to be noted too is that Buddy doesn't have thick ankles. Have you noticed? No, and he's lactose intolerant. So yeah, he and he's been milk. born in America. You see, that's wow. proof. Yeah. Another brick in the wall of the edifice of evidence mm. that Pretty Liam slick. is parading. To, yeah. What were mm. you? You were in New York. Did no, you? in Los Angeles. Okay, because I knew you lived in New York for a while. Yep, we went. We headed west. To be closer to home once we knew we were going to have a baby. <laughs> yeah. One flight. Yeah, one flight yeah. rather than two. Yeah. And you had, you, Buddy was born in Los Angeles. Yeah. Gosh, was that interesting? Uh, well, well, I mean, I we hear a lot about the American. Presumably you had health insurance or something, did you? We, uh, Janina got uh, health insurance for while she was pregnant. And uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the medical system over there has been really fantastic for us. And I've heard for so long how bad their system is, but so far, Buddy's got Obamacare. Um, it's, it works well in our favour, and everything's been going really smoothly. It's very, uh, they're very thorough. So I guess I'm singing praises to the American healthcare system right. for us, anyway. Yeah. Hmm. What's your experience of the American healthcare system, Neil? I think I've only ever had a doctor come on the road every now and again. Um, you know, and they're pretty free dispensers of um, whatever it is that you need. 
uh, on the road. So that kind of doctor. I think he was a doctor. <laughs> yes, he um, said he was a doctor. He said he was a doctor. <laughs> I've had luckily no cause for having to be uh, in hospital there, and I'm looking for wood. Can't see any. Here you go, Dad. Now, I mean, the, the guitar. Lest I, right. lest I become accused of being patsy, I am going to return to the question about Fleetwood Mac. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you how long you're going to spend with them. Is it just one tour? Oh, it's an unknown. It's, um, but we all start this chapter thinking that you know, anything is possible and um, it feels like I'm joining a real band and they want uh, me to be in the band because they know, apart from being able to sing some of the songs, which, and our song, our voices sound good together. We found that out really quickly, and that was hugely reassuring. Well, for they that didn't decision. audition you. Well, we did in a sense audition. They didn't want to call it that, but really, you have to play together to know whether it's going to work. It's no way. It seemed good on paper, but we played, and it just immediately felt like we could. We really had a good sound going, and but and their interest is in. Um, you know, being a real band and making some new music and I hope I can contribute on that front together with Mike Campbell, who's an amazing guitar player. It's an exciting lineup, and they feel that way too, so I'm glad to be part of some uh, buoyant mood that's overtaken the band. I was, I mean, everybody thinks about rumours. Not rumours, yeah. rumours, but rumours. You, you know, rumours was a defining <clears throat> moment in my life when rumours came out. Are you familiar with rumours, Liam? I think I'm much more familiar with rumours than Dad is, to yeah. be honest. Are you? Yeah. That's interesting. I'm a big Fleetwood Mac fan. Yeah. Through my wife, she introduced me to the band because I grew up not really knowing much about them apart from all the 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 drama and the... I knew the hits, obviously, because I'd heard heard them out and about. But, mm. um, no, when I met my wife, she, she made me into a huge Fleetwood yeah, Mac yeah. fan. And even if you don't know about all the personal drama, Rumours is still a fabulous album. Oh, right? yeah. Definitely, yeah. But I, I think that's been a huge part of what's made those records is the drama. Yes. I think they weren't afraid to shy away no. from knowing that that was a, a, a huge uh, no. sort of thing to draw from. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they have truth in them, all the songs. And, and uh, you know, whether they're on the pop side of Christine's songs or the or the more, um, you know, darker side of Lindsay's contributions, every song seemed to have some truth as well as, uh, you know, some, some nice embellishments as well. But I, I think they're an incredible band. I didn't know all their songs and stuff, but it's a, it's a gift to be asked to join them. Um, I want to talk about a track on your new album, Where's My Room? Yeah. Which is really an interesting sound and an unusual sound. And it seems to change gear, mm. and then it goes into this Barry White moment, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, more or less. Um, or am I talking rubbish and you just being oh, kind? I, I, I know. know what you mean, but um, there's there's like four different movements, and I'm trying to identify which. Well, the third the third movement I would say is the Barry White moment. It's got those strings, those kind of active, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, solely strings, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a really interesting development that song because it started off with just a little uh, re refrain the, that the song opens with, you know. Um, and somehow Liam and I both decided that it deserved to have quite a long development. Uh, so we tried to build it and such, and then other bits got added. And, and then... Yeah, it had a long... It took about six months for that song to kind of realise yeah. realize itself through a lot of How do you know when work. it's finished? I think well, when those strings were put on, <laughs> we were like, um, it turned into a seven-minute odyssey. They're of, pretty special, uh, <laughs> those strings, yeah. No, Victoria Kelly, yeah, who I've yeah. worked with a lot and we've worked with just recently again, um, came, and she does this a lot. When you give her something to orchestrate, she gets this kind of light in her eyes and she really enjoys doing more or less what you asked her to do and then she always comes back and says, well, I've added a little bit at the end. Um, and this happened to be a two-minute string arrangement, which we were so delighted that she'd done and we had to hear it you know, realised in the studio. So that was a great day in the studio. Um, but I think maybe for me the reason the song deserves to be long is because I've had many a night uh, on occasions coming back to a hotel a hotel at 2 or 3 in the morning where I've actually really forgotten what room I'm in and I've been wandering corridors and going up <laughs> lifts and been the wrong, op trying to open the wrong doors. Oh, no! And it the song reminds me of that a little bit. It's kind of like, um, and the, you know, li both literally and figuratively about finding your place in the world. But it deserves to feel like you're going down a very long cor corridor and behind any door there could be some little scene happening. Yeah, could be a tribute to one of the Barrett brothers, couldn't it, really? Yeah. yeah. Where's so. my room? 
Um, the other track that you want to play is Back to Life. Yeah. And I said, what about the bazookis? Because mm. you've got bazookis going. Where do they come from, those bazookis on the album? Well, actually, well, Greece. Yeah, Same. I know bazookis come from Greece. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get smart with me, Sonny. Who's playing them? There's two good <laughs> friends of ours um, from Greece who are they're sort of the local. One of them's the mayor of um, Logos, the village that we were in at the time. Where about some um, Greece are you now? We don't really want to say specifically, but at this um, point in time, we'll blow our cover. No, we okay. In the specific uh, taverna called Taxides, and the uh, owner of the bar plays the accordion, and the mayor of the little village is a amazing, well, a great bazooki player, and they they do, um, they play most, you know, once a week at least, but many nights they, you go in there and they'll just be playing around, and and they'll always hand over guitars to us, and we try and keep up, and then they'll ask us to play a song, and we feel very. Um, lame playing Beatles <laughs> covers and stuff like that when their stuff's so intricate and, and soulful. Um, but we got them involved on the song and it because mm. it sort of... The song evoked our experiences in Greece and a specific story of, a, of the woman that kind of um, is the reason that we ended up going to Greece a lot. What is, yeah, tell me the back story. Why, why do you know... Do you repeatedly go to this place in Greece where you had your pagan wedding? Yeah, there's a... There's a um, of the people that we um, went to... Greece with the first time and we've gone every year now um, have a, a family um, tragedy uh, and that drew uh, our friend George who's Greek to go back to the islands and for him so it was a, it was a return and then once we were on the island um, you know she was an incredible woman inspiring woman filmmaker from Melbourne um, we remembered her every time we went out drinking and singing and it seemed to be uh, uh, even being there was kind of a, a homage to her but then we also realised that most Greek music's built upon the concept of people having gone away. Um, they're an immigrant, you know, immigrant race, uh, immigrant race, should I say, like the Irish, much like the Irish, had to leave for hard times. And people were always missing. Their singing, the Greek blues is about missing their relatives or missing people who have passed on. And um, that, that act of getting together and singing and raising glasses is in a way evoking the gods. And that's, that seems like the, that's, the, that's the concept that we're exploring in this song. It's odd. The bazooki's an odd sound, isn't it? Because it's both jolly and sad at the mm. same time. It is. It has got great melancholy um, attached to it. Anyway, no bazooki, but never mind. Just we'll see if it. you can do it without the bazooki, I'll shall do my we? best. Yeah. I know you Have a secret No flavor as big as your thirst. I can't find you underwater. Those far away eyes, Joe, Mama, call it out to me. We'll turn the light on. Your voice is commanding, commanding and I am loyal to the cause. My voice, my voice is demanding, demanding to the gods. Come on, bring them back to life and immortalize our heart. I've seen it. Traveled man, there is no sorrow that can be undone. He knows every single word of like a rolling stone. Your voice.
the night belongs to you And Orpheus is playing his guitar Our boats are tied up next to the bar The more we sing, the less we have to say A kiss to make love Your voice is commanding And I am loyal to the cause My voice, my voice is demanding To the gods, come on Will you bring us back to life with your voice? It's the only way you learn To keep the flame aglow I promise that when I'm on the run, it's the only way you learn to keep the flame aglow. With every passing day, we multiply. Back to life, and that's the single from the album. That's the first song, the lead cut. The lead yes. cut. Is it obvious to you guys what should be the single? Not at all. That one was was not really even on our minds. It's the first, for us, you know, when you have the what the first song you want people to hear of your record, quite often it it's not necessarily a perverse choice, but quite often it's one that that sums up the record to you or the sound or the yeah or the, the one character you're, you're proudest of because it's the most different from what you would normally do. What it's still ha- very catchy that song, though. Thank you. I, I, I love people responded to it at the record company, and people on tour were responding to it, and we thought, well, let's just put a likable a little chunk of song out there to start off with and let's see how we go from there. But we've got lots, yeah. of, lots of colour and movement in the record that we're excited for people to hear. Mm. Are you ambitious, Liam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think I, I think I have been very ambitious. I think that, um, you know, my perspective has changed a lot since having a kid and since um, doing this job for the last however many years it has been. In the sense that I, my idea of success and what I want to be doing has changed compared to what it is when you're a teenager and you think you're going to be in a band and it's exciting and you want to play big shows to as many people as possible. And you Does want that to... mean you want to be famous or is um, it different? Well, you want to be famous for being good at what you're doing. You know, it wasn't like it's a, a want to be fame at any cost. It was more so you want to be recognised as a, as a great musician. You know, I watched Dad have a lot of success and people love what he did and, and see the, the, the joy that it brought to people and I thought that, that looked like a pretty good And the Freudian thing. darkness came upon you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But, no, I think in the last, you know, like after releasing quite a few records, you realise that if you're not doing it somewhat for yourself and for your own enjoyment of the making of the music and, you know, because it can be pretty torturous at times to write, keep writing and trying to keep finding new exp- experiences to gather from because you don't want to keep, redoing the same thing over and over, I realised that there wasn't always reward on the other end as far as success or money or um, that whether people are even going to like what you're doing. So you have to be following your own muse and, and doing it the way you want to be doing it, being true to yourself. Otherwise, But if everybody hated what you were doing, you wouldn't keep doing it, right? No, I don't think that's the case. Don't you? Well, I mean, I don't hope... I, there are people that hate what I do and I... I've experienced that and I've read things. Um, (laughs) Let me just open up uh, Facebook and uh, no, no, there are, you know, there's people you get criticism. Everyone gets criticism. In a way, the more successful you are, the more people come out and with their hate as well. Mm. Um, And it's not a, you know, it's not a big deal if you're enjoying it yourself and if you're pleasing your own creative um, urges, you know. That is the trouble with social media, right? I mean, before people would, keep their hate to themselves or just wander off and not listen. They no but voice. now they yeah. have to say it. Well, yeah. yeah, they say it on your platform. So it's definitely something it's entertainment. that entertainment. Yeah. I don't really, you know, I'd like to think I don't look at it that much and I don't take it on board, but then occasionally you do. And especially when you've got something new out, you are um, Vulnerable. anxious to see what, yeah. what, you know, how people take it. So, but, you know, I, I've, I've also, I've found myself gravitating towards producing music for other people, for make doing soundtracks and doing things that don't involve the I aspect of it, the promoting Liam Finn as a brand. That's kind of gotten... That's why I guess I don't think I'm as ambitious in that sense to be um, a, a star or something. I just want to be able to keep making music because it's what I love to do. I, I would 
just pitch in here that that sometimes those you know I don't know there wouldn't be hardly an artist on earth that doesn't occasionally feel um, that kind of insecurity about well what what does anybody care about what I do you know so but you have to balance that out by every time you write a song you have to think it's the most important thing in the world that you're doing um, so there's a kind of a dichotomy there in creativity generally I think and you have to get resilient and 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 tough. But all that it takes to, to make it feel worthwhile, to my mind, no matter what level you're at, is when somebody relates to you a personal experience of a song that you wrote that saw them through a, a hard time or suddenly yeah. it, that song resonates. And I am just think for some reason it flashed in my head that song that they used Second Chance for that really beautiful piece of footage about that guy recovering from Alzheimer's. What was that thing? And it went... Oh, yeah. You didn't know, you hardly knew it was happening, but... It swept around, and there was this gorgeous guy in America who who came out of a um, a long period of not being able to communicate with anybody, and uh, with music, as we know, music has this great power. And they used Second Chance as a kind of an accompaniment to that bit of film. And I, it wasn't the it wasn't the song that brought him out of the Alzheimer's, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it might have been, <laughs> no, but it was. We can lead people to believe that. It was, <laughs> but it, but nevertheless, oh, you're a stickler it, for the truth, Liam. Yeah, no, well, I, no I agree. And some I, things, I think it is the little the little bits and pieces that you hear when you meet people that yeah. do um, fuel really you counts. and keep you keep you doing it. Yeah. You know. And I mean that's what you when you say making memories, mm. that's what you guys are doing because the thin music has been going mm. on long enough for people to have yeah. woven it into their lives. Yeah, I think no matter like Dad was saying, no matter where you are in your career or what sort of experience you've had, there's still what I've learned from Dad is there's still um, it doesn't get any easier to write a song. You still gotta really want to do it and you've got to fight for it. Um, being unsuccessful or successful doesn't have any effect on that and we both have a real ambition to write good music. That's where the ambition lies, I think, in this family. But if nobody liked it, what would tell you it was good? Nobody if liked we, it. If we liked it but nobody else liked yeah. it, then that would be enough because in a way we're pretty, um, you know, we'd just, there'd right, be a Neil? bit of a, a middle finger to everyone that didn't like it. We'd be like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. I I don't know. I don't know whether that's true. Well, I mean, I, I, I admire you for being tenacious about that point, Kim. But it's a really, it's quite a dark thought that nobody, if you were, if people were throwing things at you and nobody would even open the door or listen to you if they, if they said stop it every time you opened your mouth, mm. oh, you probably would stop. Mm. But that ain't given. That's never going to yeah, happen because there is people with terrible music taste out there. So there's <laughs> always an audience. There's for... always somebody that is <laughs> tone deaf that but will I'm love just, what we do. But I'm just checking you because you know a lot of people say, oh, I have to write. I don't care if nobody reads it or I have to make music and I know, you know, it's, I don't mind. That no, sounds kind of painfully earnest. I know the point you're talk, making. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And, uh, yeah. well, I mean, I artists that. have to face that, don't they? And, and the reality yeah. is I don't yeah. actually have anything else I can do. So it's not that I have to, it's just that I have to now because I don't, you know, I'm not, I, I can make a good coffee. Yeah. For my, for mum and dad. He's yeah. got, and that's he's probably got, about it. It's about it. It's really good with his milk management. Yeah. yeah, funnily enough, because mm. I've noticed he's got very slim ankles. <laughs> uh, lives in America most of the time. I don't, yeah. to be honest. I've actually but that's maybe it's a bitterness that I have is that my ankles aren't that thin. Did they... Dad? Dad is known more for his calves and I, ankles. I have very slender calves. I won't show them in this interview, but no, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> can you? Yeah, yeah. I'm wearing. Sl oh, that's pretty good. I was thinking about um, doing new things. And you did that extraordinary webcasty thing, Neil. Last year. Ah. Yeah. And then culminating in the live webcast recording yeah. of Out of Silence. Yeah, Liam was uh, was there for that um, little extravaganza too, and helped me produce the whole thing. That I mean, was, that was a new, a whole new thing, wasn't it? It was certainly new for me in every aspect. Yeah, and I, I think it was probably. Um, I don't know if anyone's done that exact thing, but I've got this great resource, this studio that is really fun to set up and do events in, and I've done a few now. I also love recording. I, I love performing live on the internet and having that feeling like you're directing yourself. You're not part of a TV program. You're able to have a whim and, and follow it. Um, it's extraordinarily self-confident or brave. And it's like I really like going to rehearsals of plays because yeah. I like seeing the bones of how they're being put together. Yeah. And it and it and it's similar. What you did is similar, right? Well, it was similar. We made events of the rehearsal period and we did quite a lot of rehearsal out of sight actually. You know, I mean there's an element of um artful, trickery. Trickery and artfulness always skullduggery I would almost say, mm. but there's definitely uh, there was a desire once we hit that um red light 
on in August and we were recording. There was no trickery at that point. We performed those songs completely live. We spent, Liam and uh, uh, the others spent three days mixing it and it was out five, four days later. So, which felt like an extraordinarily yeah. fun, good thing to do. But man, I was exhausted at the end yeah, of it, I'll tell yeah. you what. Uh, now I wouldn't be in such a hurry to put it out the week following. I think if, if the only thing I come away from thinking, I didn't really need to burn at the other end. The event itself was good. We should have just taken our time, mm. mixed it at our leisure. So what are you saying? It was there a are personal... certain things that aren't as good as you might have done no, it, if you'd had more time. It's not the result of the music. I think it's more like a record company... This is pretty boring, to be honest, but a record company likes a bit of time to prepare to release an album so they can get all their, you know, Marketing ducks business. in a line. Yeah. But we, when you give them four days, they kind of go, oh, 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 and then well, it kind of goes out and, you you know. Everyone agreed the idea was great and it was fun and it was really good. And the music, and I think the album actually doesn't sound like a hastily assembled live album. It has a very sophisticated right. sound to it, but I don't think anybody knew quite how to look at it as an actual proper record or something. But actually, to go back, I think actually what you're saying before too was right. I think if we had had a week or two, we could have made it even better. No. But, but I'm always thinking that. But what you're saying is it was just released too quickly and the public didn't have time to, to get their excitement up. Is that what you're saying, Well, Leo? it just somehow put it in a different category, like it wasn't a serious record. It was an event that was uh, that we a did, live you know, album, yeah. some gimmick. Right. It, you know, it attached just a hint of gimmick to it, which I didn't feel like it was at all. So. No. But these are things you think in hindsight as you're mulling around at three in the morning. Trying to find your room. <laughs> Trying to find my room. Right. Um you're a grandfather now, of course. I am. For the first time. Uh, man, that feels good. And his, How re- is his that? real name is Buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Senior. Buddy so, Malosi Finn. Uh, uh, Malosi? Malosi. Now, what does that mean? It means strong in Samoan. Nice. Yeah. Buddy Strong Finn. He's like friendly, strong mm. Finn. And he is. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> How old is he now? He's 21, 21 months. Oh, he'd be playing the tambourine 21. already then, won't he? Oh, he loves to drum. He does he's much, a drummer? much more than a tambourine, I'll have you know. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got, uh, he got a, you know, he loves Freddie Mercury yeah. singing We Will Rock You and that's his, you know, performance mode. Okay. At the moment. All right. But we're training him with, yes. with you know, a bit of Miles Davis and a bit of Fela Kuti. Get him on the bazooki. Get him Maybe some. not Fela. Why? Well, there's some terrible allegations against that guy. Oh, no. Uh, Is there? Yeah. Oh, God, I can't listen to Fella Cootie anymore. Oh, God. Damn. Well, you can make that well, decision. These people with feet of clay, they're toppling all over the place. Yeah. It's oh, not well. going to happen with you guys, is it? God, no. No, please say. Because, you know. I don't have to say. People I've loved all my life and no, then I, you yeah. find that they've, you know. I've, I've, we've got no skeletons that, uh, you know. Denzel... Washington and... Oh. Denzel? Really? Ah, sorry. Didn't, didn't mean oh. to say that. <laughs> oh, Jesus, <laughs> Kim. That's I know. a terrible oh, front car there. Um, well, God, all right. you know, God is even... My goodness. In the immediate... God's in trouble, apparently. In the immediate... Oh, God. Um, <laughs> God. In the immediate future, like for the remainder of August... Yep. Um, ...and on into October, Liam, what are you looking forward to most? Um, hanging out with Buddy over summer. In Los Angeles. Oh. And then maybe catching a Fleetwood Mac show. Hey. <laughs> You'd have to come back to New Zealand for summer, right? Uh, that summer. I'm talking about my summer over in LA. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I live, th- I have summer, summer, summer. Yeah, yeah. It's, but LA's boring, isn't it? You just, it's got no weather. It's just like. Uh, it has more weather than it's given credit for. Does it? it? Yeah, no, but the thing is that I really like the fact that it's sunny most days because it puts everyone in a very good mood. But when it does, when there is, uh, you know, rain and they have the, they get really windy. There's the um, Santa Ana winds, which are really wild and make everyone feel a bit weird. And I, I enjoy those days and nights. And what are you going to do in LA? Um, make music. I've got a little studio out the back and, you know, we would have been promoting this record this year and we will be still doing the odd thing here and there, but I'll be working on new stuff of my own, but also we're going to be finishing off a movie that we made of the tour that we did earlier in the, the yeah, year yeah, of yeah. New Zealand shows. So we'll be mixing songs from that. Mixing. And, Where can yeah. one see that movie? Uh, they'd have to go to an edit suite just in Newton. <laughs> At the moment. Um, <laughs> but it's been, eventually it will be released yeah. where? We uh, hope it'll be a cinema release. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess it'll be the fest- a festival st- style of movie and then possibly on a, on a Netflix of some sort. That'd be a lovely <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're waiting. It's such a vast amount of material and yeah. Yeah. and some really good stuff, I think. But Who shot it? Um, Daryl Ward. 
our friend Daryl Ward, who goes right back to when these boys were. He took me to A and E when I knocked out my front tooth when I was twelve. Mm. How did you do that? Um, jamming on a basketball hoop. Yeah. Slam dunking. Well, you just <laughs> you jumped up and put the ball in. I had a mini tramp that I'd put next to my hoop that I would lower, and I would do really spectacular NBA Jam style dunks. By um, bouncing on the trampoline? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Back flips, front flips, 360s, everything. And I swung on it and it and slipped off, landed on my face. So not, this has happened to me a few times actually now, hasn't it, with the wedding and the... Yeah, yeah, you have got a... But yeah. that time Accident I knocked out my prone. tooth. Slightly yeah. clumsy. Yeah. But, so um, smile yeah. at me now. Oh, you got it fixed. Good. It got yeah. a great dentist. It's dead, but it doesn't look too bad. <laughs> They're and false. Yeah. It's not false. Oh, what? Well, I, I, what do you I, mean? It's not false. Well, it's the tooth's not false. Oh, I saw you cleaning. They shoved it back up, and it and they strapped it in, and it did die. The nerve's gone, but it stayed in there. Oh, it's, it's the same it's, tooth. It's the same tooth. Yeah. Good lord! Yeah. You wouldn't be eating carrots with your front teeth anytime soon. It's then, pretty would you? strong. Is I, that? I've got an eye tooth that's a lot less strong because it's a baby tooth because the may the big the big tooth's growing into my nose. What? Yeah. That's oh, why I'm I sound. Into that's your why. Nose. I, that's, That's why I sound a bit like bit nasally. That's a genetic flaw, I might add. I've got the same. I had the same thing. And we'll see if Buddy has it as well. Yeah, we have. We both have had nose uh, second teeth that uh, decided to grow at a ninety degree angle to what they should have, and ended up in our noses. Had to be removed surgically. Both of us. Mine's still there, to be honest. Is it? Yeah. I've, they told me I didn't have to have it removed until it started um, looking like a really bad bogey. Oh no! So look. <laughs> I feel like I. this is the answer to the question I didn't ask you, which is tell me something that nobody knows about you. And now I it. just wish you hadn't. Oh. <laughs> but you had to have the tooth out, Neil. Yeah, I did, yeah. Right. I, I, it was a long process too, I might add. Did it start looking like a really big bogey? Um, never got to that stage. No, I wouldn't let it get to that stage. No, um, I, no. Was, uh, my, my, I remember my mother taking me up to Auckland. We stayed at the Waterfront Motel. I remember it very clearly. And having this incredible feeling of my whole mouth having swollen up and stitches everywhere and, you know. People, other people have had the same experience, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, you keep close eye on Buddy. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I'll let you know. No yeah. point in asking you, Neil, what you're looking forward to August, September, October? I'm looking forward to um, joining my third band mm. and uh, making some really good music and yeah, having an adventure, for, absolutely for sure. But I'm actually also really looking forward to hanging out in Los Angeles with these guys and Buddy because we won't, we're, you know, they work at a relatively good pace, four or five hours a day. We're going to have plenty of time to to have fun, to swim and to go on hikes. Yeah. And we, Liam and I will also get a chance to play a few shows and do a bit of stuff for our record, which is, you know, really exciting too. Swimming pools, yeah. movie yeah. stars. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> we're just down the road, a seven-minute Uber ride from these guys. Mm. 